Welcome back. In this video, we're going to discuss our exciting conversations about surfaces in R3 by talking about more interesting surfaces. In the last set of videos in this lesson, we focused on planes, which are linear surfaces. In this set of videos, we're going to focus on nonlinear surfaces, which you might call quadratic surfaces. For those of you viewers at home, you might have the question, well, that's nice, but what's a quadratic surface? I am so glad that you asked. Quadratic surfaces are described by quadratic equations in three variables. When I was a student, I remember thinking, what the heck is a quadratic equation? I know what my teacher told me, but why is it called quadratic? The word cuadro in Spanish literally corresponds to a shape with four sides, all of which have the same length. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it's a square. So when we think about the word cuadro in Spanish, we think about the word square. And I would imagine, I'm not a linguist, but I would imagine the quadratic, that root word is as similar to the word cuadro. So when we're thinking about quadratic equation, you could think about an equation that involves squares, some square power. Quadratic surfaces are described by quadratic equations, having squares, that have three variables. Let's go ahead and look at what that might look like. The general equation for a quadratic surface, we will write as an implicit equation, which we've talked more about than probably you ever hoped for. Great. In other words, we'll have f of x, y, z equal to zero, and the specific form of the quadratic equations that we're going to look like, we'll have ax squared, so there's the squared, there's the quadro part of it, by squared plus c z squared, and then there's going to be a bunch of additional terms. We might have some constant d times x, y, a constant capital E. These are all scalars, by the way. And we might call this like x, z. And then we have a constant f times variables y, z. And we just keep on going. Here we would have g times x plus h times y. Oh my god, I'm running out of room. No! No! Rookie! Plus j equals zero. OK, I barely made it. Uh, that's a rookie move. I gave myself way too much space over here and not enough over here. But anyways, this is the general equation for a quadratic surface. And notice we have the zero on the right-hand side. And then this whole expression, this beast of an expression, is the implicit function. And it's implicit because if we think about z as our output variable, z is not written as a function of x and y. This is the general form of a quadratic equation, kind of a beast. I know, I know. OK, it's a beauty. I agree. It's very beautiful. When we look at that equation, I perhaps should keep this up here just so we can look back at it as we talk about some of the specifics. There are some assumptions that we're going to make to force this to be a quadratic equation in three variables or a quadratic surface. The coefficients a, b, c, d, e, f, g, all of those coefficients all the way down to j, they all must be real numbers. And then the claim that we make in quadratic surfaces are that some of the leading coefficients of the nonlinear terms, so those are a, b, c, d, e, f, at least one of those should be non-zero. And the reason we make that assumption is, assume that a, b, c, d, e, f are all zero. Well, that's an equation of a plane. A plane is not a quadratic surface. A plane is a linear surface. Now that we have that out of the way, I wanted to remind us or remind ourselves, I, who am I talking to? I wanted to remind you, the viewer, that when we are graphing surfaces in R3, in this class, we're going to use Mathematica software. 
Sometimes when we're looking at quadratic surfaces, we can change the general implicit equation, f of x, y, z equals zero, into an explicit equation where we solve for z in terms of x and y. If we can do this, we say that the graph is most amenable, I guess, or it's easier to use plot 3D. You could use either one. But the whole idea is if I can isolate the output variable in terms of the two inputs, then I'm going to use plot 3D as a command. If not, if I cannot get z in terms of x and y, or if I just don't feel like doing the extra work, or blah, 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 then we would call it an implicit equation, and we'll use the contour plot 3D command. You will see examples of each of these as we go on in the lessons for quadratic surfaces. Okay. Well, one of the questions that you might have, do you feel yourself curious? Like, oh my god, what do the graphs of these surfaces look like? Tell me more. Before I can tell you more, I think it's important that we, that we actually discuss what the heck a graph is. Because it's not always clear what, a, what it actually means to graph something. So in this case, we're going to define the graph of a surface in R3 as coming from an equation in three variables in one of our two general forms. So the explicit equation was when we have the output variable as an explicit function of the two inputs. And the implicit equation general form was when we did not isolate the output in terms of the input, but instead wrote an expression on the left-hand side and a zero on the right hand side. Assuming we have one of these two situations, we're going to define the graph of such functions. So we could call the graph of lowercase f or of capital F. They're actually, you can use them interchangeably. The graph is the set of all valid ordered triplets x, comma, y, comma, z that make the defining equation true. Moreover, we visualize these valid order triplets on the coordinate axis in R3. The word valid is kind of subtle. It means that the x and y are in the domain of the function or that the actual equations make sense there. And we'll see what an invalid order triplet might be in a future video. All right, so we've defined the concept of graph. We've defined the idea that we will use uh, Mathematica. The last thing that I want to say is Mathematica is not a medicine that cures all headaches. In fact, if you use it incorrectly, Mathematica can actually cause you a lot of headaches. One thing that I'm going to recommend that we do is before we use the computer, we use our brain. Your brain is the most powerful computer on earth, by the way. If, if people could replicate your brain, they would be billionaires. Um, when we're graphing quadratic surfaces, we'll use a following set of tools to prime our brain so that we can best use computers. The first set of tools that we're going to use is called input-output analysis, which is to think about, if I'm going to graph my surface, what are actually valid inputs, x and y, and valid outputs, z. If these were functions, you would call this the domain and range analysis, but because we're implicit relations, it's just figuring out what are the ranges of x, y, and z that are allowed on these equations. When we're looking at the second tool that we'll use is intercepts, and this is where the surface will cross the coordinate axis. In order to define intercepts, we're going to determine points where the surface intersect the coordinate axis, and to do so, we're going to set um, variables x, y, and z equal to zero in pairs, and solve for the third variable. And we'll show examples of this as we look through the four quadratic surfaces that we're going to focus on in this lesson. Finally, we're, the last tool that we'll use to use our brains before we use computers is the concept of a trace. And to find the trace of a surface, we actually take a cross section of the surface in, in a specific plane that we define. There are three very, very famous traces. The first one is what we call the xy trace. That's where we look at a curve in R3 that lies in the intersection between the plane z equal to 0. So this would be the xy plane. 
and the equation for the xy plane is z equal to zero, and then the graph of the surface. So this trace is literally where a plane at zero intersects the, the um, surface that we're looking at. The yz trace, the xz trace, doesn't come from setting z equal to zero, it comes from setting y equal to zero. In other words, we look at the intersection of the xz plane, the one encoded by y equals zero, and the graph of the curve in R3. That intersection, the intersection of the xz plane and the surface in R3, that's going to be called the xz trace. Given these two traces, I have a challenge for the audience member. Please write for yourself what you think the yz trace is and how you would find it. Dun, dun, dun. Do you feel your palms sweating? I hope so. The last thing that I wanted to say is, although the xy trace, the xz trace, and the yz trace are the most famous, we can actually find other traces. For example, you might set the output variable z equal to a constant valid z naught. So this is some z naught that actually is on the graph of your surface. And if you did that and took the intersection of this plane with the surface, you would get a trace that lies in the z equals z naught plane. This equation right here defines a plane that is parallel to the xy axis. And just a quick shout out to your past thinking. Remember that parallel planes have normal direction, have normal vectors in the same direction. So here, look at the normal vector. This plane, the plane z equals z naught, has a normal vector. Well, let's see. No scalar on x, no scalar on y, one scalar on z. And that's the same normal vector as if you did the xy plane. Now that we've set up some structures we'll use to talk about graphing surfaces, let's jump over and do examples of four absolutely gorgeous quadratic surfaces. I'll see you in the next video.